Welcome to Path to Cytoscon, episode four. Uh, the topic for today is how I got started as a developer and in Postgres. I'm Claire Giordano. And I'm Pino DeCandia. Um, and if you're attending live, I just mentioned, you can join the text chat in the hashtag Cytoscon channel um, in the Path to Cytoscon EO4 thread. Uh, we're joined today by Thomas Monroe who is a Postgres committer. He works on the Postgres team here at Microsoft. He's based in New Zealand. Um, so it's very early in the morning for him right now. And we really appreciate him um, getting up so early to join us. Um, and incidentally, uh, Thomas gave a talk at CitusCon, an event for Postgres, which happened back in April. And it was all about parallelism in Postgres. Um, and that, that talk is kind of what inspired us to invite Thomas to join us here today. Um, Good morning. We're... Good morning, Thomas. And we're also joined by Melanie Plegeman, who is a Postgres contributor, also works on the Postgres team here at Microsoft. Melanie recently contributed PGSAT.io to Postgres 16, and she gave a talk about it at CitusCon. Uh, the talk was titled Additional IO Observability in Postgres with PGSAT.io. I uh, recommend everyone check it out. It was a great talk. Um, and also, look Melanie, Melanie gave. Melanie gave that a similar talk about PGStat.io last week at PGCon, if I recall correctly. Oh, no. Last week, I, I talked about um, like benchmarking IO also, but uh, using visuals to, bench, uh, to understand benchmarks. Got it. OK, so we can check out your CitusCon talk online. And then um, I presume you're going to post the slides from, from last week's PGCon talk as well. Yes, I will post them. Awesome. Um, so I think the first question we want to start with before we talk about how you got started in Postgres is just how you all got started as developers. And and then, Pino, I'm going to ask you the same question, and you're probably going to ask me the same question, because all of us started um, or at some point in our careers were developers. Um, so Sounds Melanie, great. maybe start with you. How did you get started as a developer? Yeah, so when I was in college, I was super interested in computer science and in programming. I took some classes uh, and I struggled a lot with it. I felt like uh, it just, a lot of it didn't make sense. We One of the things they have you do at the beginning is make games and uh, everything was in Java and it just felt like there was a lot of magic and I didn't really, I felt like I didn't really understand, you know, how computers actually work. Um, so I ended up abandoning it and actually I, there's a funny story. So when I, I did an independent study my last year of college, which was like, why can't Melanie understand programming and with the computer science department. And I read different, um, like research about how, you know, different people's learning styles and how to understand how to code and that kind of thing and how your learning style influences that. Um, which <laughs> is like funny looking back on it. Cause the professor of that class Sometimes, you know, we message each other and it's like, now I'm a software engineer. So it's kind of funny. Um, and so I did a startup after, um, after college and I just felt really, uh, really strongly that I'd seen technology make all these amazing changes in the world. Um, like I did work with different nonprofits and, and seeing how, you know, blogging platforms really like um, empowered people, I think made me think, that's what I really wanted to do was be able to make things that were accelerators or that enabled people. And I thought that that was super amazing. So I, on my spare time, tried to teach myself to, to code in various different ways. And then um, after going back and I did IT consulting um, for a couple of years and they encourage you to kind of go more towards the sales and mark, you know, sort of like selling consulting work as opposed to coding and, and developing products. So I saved up money and said, I'm going to quit my job and I'm just going to figure out how to become a full-time software engineer. And um, so I spent at, at that job, one of the last things I had done was start to use Postgres. And so um, when I quit my job, basically, my boyfriend at the time was like, okay, let's make a syllabus for you to like sort of check off all these things and figure out how to become a developer. And so we started with um, 
forget the name of the book, but it, I think it's like it's a uh, it's basically st- and starting from you know the fundamental like building blocks of computers, like what is a processor and what are you know the sort of uh, electrical engineering kind of things and um, going up from there and and so like I spent a long time trying to learn the basics and then learning about okay what are functional programming languages what are you know and so it was an, a really interesting way to do it and what I found was that I sort of learn more I learned better from other people and from collaboration and um, so I kind of came to it realizing that I had a very different learning style and that just like reading something in a book. I'm definitely not a solo hacker, like just reading something and figuring out on my own, even if I, it just doesn't work that well for me. So to, what I found is that just like coding with other people and talking to other people about coding was how I really learned. I find that really interesting. So you, you, you sort of need to know what's happening in all the layers to feel comfortable with, with, with what you're doing. Do you yeah. find that that's still the case uh, as uh, you approach new technologies and and how you know I, I I find there's always stuff that you just can't get around to doing so I'm 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 amazed that you can go that deep uh, and how how has that been more recently? Yeah, so I think that was why even though initially my interest in programming was like kind of more things that were higher level like applications that were making it possible for people to, you know, have their voice be heard in the Arab Spring and things like that. Even though that was what initially drew me to technology, when I started actually coding, I found that I didn't like application development at all because I wanted to know how things worked. And so that's what kind of drew me to to more to like systems programming. And um, I think that even though what we do is as Postgres developers is like pretty detached from, I mean, databases definitely enable people to do things, but it's a few steps away from people doing transformative, you know, things with technology. But like, I think I kind of came to this point where I realized, what do I actually enjoy doing on a day to day basis? And it's like, I really want to understand how things work. And that's continued till now. I mean, I definitely spend more time solo hacking than I did initially. But like, when I was doing a project for like storage tuning for Azure, uh, when I joined Microsoft, like understanding actually what was happening in the Linux kernel and like trying to really understand every part of the storage stack completely was important to me before I could say, oh, okay, I recommend this tuning or that tuning, or let me just throw things at the wall. I had to like go all the way down until I understood it at, you know, on, okay, what is the driver doing? What is this doing? What is that doing? And like ended up, you know, contributing a patch to Linux. And I feel like that is this, these two parts of me. And one is like, I want to help and enable people. But what I actually, what my brain, <laughs> how my brain wants to process things is like, let me completely understand it, which are kind of not like disjoint things in some ways. I'm still wondering about that that class you took in college about the way that people learn. Um, did you fall into a particular category of how you learn? Was there some epiphany for you there? That I mean, I did all these it, choices. Yeah, I mean, I didn't really fit into any of the categories of like, you know, you learn like auditory, you learn from hearing lectures, or you learn from writing notes or whatever. I think like a little bit or visual learner like I think if anything it was maybe more like tactile learning was something I identified with like actually doing something um but I think what I got out of it was that talking about it and talking about concepts with people um was sort of how I learned and I think it's it's kind of like I'm not a tinkerer which I always felt like you know you can't be a good engineer if you're not a tinkerer that's like what my perception was um but i think i do i like the things that i understand the best are actually you know things that i literally did but especially things that i did and then i talked about with other people and like you know taught other people or discussed with other people i want to throw in something this is um a little bit off topic uh, and then we'll come right back but this morning i was listening to neil degrasse Tyson talk about uh, the astrophysicist talk about his um, 
podcast Star Talk, and he uh, he has a comedian on with him in every episode of the podcast because um, uh, laughing and joking while you and, and being in a good mood helps remember. Uh, that's the theory behind um, that. So I thought that was relevant to this this uh, question of styles of learning and how learning is effective. Well, that's why I'm here, Pino. Right? I'm supposed to make you laugh. <laughs> Fair. I can see Fair that, like, that you, you kind have. of remember something because you joked about it or whatever. Yeah, I also maybe your just brain is just link. more open. Yeah, I found the link to the book that was super influential. It's called Nanta Tetris. And it was like you go, it's called, you know, building a modern computer from first principles. And this was what oh, cool. made me finally have an aha moment about computers. <laughs> Awesome. Thank I'd almost I'd given up on I'd given up on understanding the whole stack. Now that you've put that link there, I'm I'm gonna check it out and see. Um, yeah, it's really cool. Fill the gaps. Yep. <laughs> okay, I want to pivot to Thomas for a second and start at first principle. How did you get started as a developer? What what led you huh. there and what what kept you there? Okay. Well, I, I'm gonna go back a bit further. Um, I'm I'm a a bit older, and in the 1980s, we had um, 8-bit computers, like Commodore 64s and that kind of stuff. And, but and, and I was lucky; my my mum got me a, a Sinclair ZX81, which was a tiny, tiny computer. Probably not uh, known all around the world, but it's it's a small British computer that I think it cost less than 50 bucks or something. I don't know; it was very small. Um, and back in those days, if you wanted to make a computer do something interesting. It, and you're a kid, right? And you've, you've got a lot of time on your hands and, and a small number of books. There's no, no internet and there's no, like maybe you've got some finite number of games or whatever and a few magazines. And you, if you want to try and do something interesting with that, you really have to tinker a lot. And so I guess I followed the kind of tinkerer path from there. You know, um, When I was a student, I was studying linguistics. Um, thought I wanted to be a linguist at some point. Um, <clears throat> and, but I, I, I did a fair amount of kind of like tinkering and programming, and I kind of wanted to use computers in, in linguistics. Um, but at some point, a job came up where somebody, a stu a, another student, had left town in the middle of a project, and, somebody, and they were desperate for a C programmer to finish this computer program. And I, I took that job, and I eventually... That was just a, series, a chain of events from there. I eventually actually dropped out of the linguistics course and just went to hack on computers full time. Um, that's kind of how I got started with computers. Um, so, so you dropped out of linguistics. Does that mean you dropped out of school altogether or just yeah, out of I that didn't... program? Okay. I, I didn't finish my degree. Yeah. I, which I kind of regret, but um, I sometimes think I should just go back and do that. But um it's funny because you love learning and like reading academic papers and that kind of stuff more than anyone else i know <laughs> <laughs> yeah well you don't have to be in the program to read the papers yeah. right i mean and, and and especially these days right i mean it's just information is so easy to get i can in a way back then it, um you know it, back then there was a lot more gatekeeping of information and, and knowledge and ideas I think than there is now, or at least it felt that way to me. I don't know. Um, yeah, yeah, I don't feel like my children. I, I obviously took them to the library a lot as they were growing up. That was like one of our weekly activities. But I don't feel like they ever they really understand that you used to actually have to go to the library to find some things out. Like there was no yeah. internet. There was no way to discover at home. Like there there, there was no computer sitting on your desk um, necessarily. Yeah. So yeah. So I, you, I remember, I remember one particular uh, purchase. I remember getting a, getting a, a reference manual for the, the, the Zilog Z80 CPU that was in my computer. And I remember that the book cost more than the computer. And it was, you know, it was really hard to convince my parents to buy that. <laughs> um, yeah, it's just different times. I mean, parents, you would expect... Yeah. Did your parents do tech? Did they like... No, not at all. No, they made nothing. Like, to them, this was all just some weird amusement. Like, they didn't really... Um, um, yeah, I, I don't think back then, at least where I was from, I don't think people really saw computers as a 
serious thing yet. Like it wasn't like a thing that you wanted your kids to get into or 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 anything like that. Um, maybe they were worried you play too many games or something. You know, <laughs> that was about it. You know. Um, well, so you said there's this chain of events, right? That you dropped out of linguistics, dropped out of school, and went to hack full time. Um, what, yeah. what kinds of things did you go to hack on? What were you doing? Well, um, the first thing I, the first job I got um, when I was still at university, I was, uh, um, it was, it was some software for a um, for a factory. It was software automation, uh, auto, factory automation software where there was sensors all over the, the, the factory, and it, it was a Unix system. It was Go Unix, and so, and I, I kind of knew a bit of C because at that point I had I had an Amiga at home, and I had the C comp I had one of the C compilers for the Amiga, and I sort of knew the basics of C programming. Um, I would, certainly wasn't very good at it, but it was enough to land this job, finishing this this project because some other person had left, and it wasn't super hard. Um, so you know th that was a nice way to get started, and so I fin I. It was like, you know, cursors software, like N cursors software, like trying to do a GUI on a on a text terminal screen using, um, you know, fairly simple drawing primitives and stuff. And I, it was it was a software for controlling machines that process wool, and I, I can't even remember the, the details, but it was, yeah, it was writing code in C on a Unix system, which kind of really opened the the world of Unix to me, and I realized that wow, there's this whole culture of things happening there and, and in fact around that time um if you wanted to use go unix back then that was the, the that was system 5 unix for for pcs like for 386 computers or whatever um it was just around the time that that um, linux was coming out um freebsd and things like that were around as well um and um around that time to if, if you were Working in, in C on, on one of these System 5 Unix systems, I think it cost thousands of dollars per seat to use the compiler, for example. Like, the system didn't come with a compiler. If you wanted the compiler, it was really expensive. It also didn't come with TCP, and if you wanted that, it was really expensive. And around that time, um, my, my boss on that project found out about GCC, the, the GNU compiler, and it was just... Like, we, we gradually began using more and more of those tools, even though we weren't yet using Linux. And... Um, yeah, it's sort of a, a real gateway to a whole universe of of Unix stuff and the, the world of open source software, which kind of exploded from there, really. Um, but if yeah. I were to simplify your experience, you're a self-taught engineer. Yeah, I guess that's true. I mean, I mean, I, with I, the, the help I, of I, I, books and other people that you might have worked with, and. Yeah. I mean, there's there's a, a huge aspect of it is learning from from specific people, like people that along along the way I've, um, yeah, there's certain people that have been kind of technical mentors and kind of shown the way to interesting problems and yeah. Were there any times that you thought of 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 taking a break or or, or changing fields? Just curious, uh, changing directions, not not being a developer. No, no, I wouldn't say so. I mean, there are there's fields and there's fields, right? I mean, you can use computers to solve all kinds of problems, and you can work in different spaces. Um, sometimes it's nice to change space that you're working in, right? Like I didn't, like at the moment, I'm 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 working on on Postgres and I have done for quite a while now and it, and I, I don't plan to change that. But, you know, in the past I worked in a, applying computer technology to financial stuff, for example, and that was an industry that I was in for a decade. And that, um, you know, you can, you can change pretty completely while staying with computers as a, as a basic skill set, right? And I've, I've met folks that are, that, are, that are, I mean, I've met folks that are primarily interested in, a, in an area. And and others that just think of themselves as developers, and mm -hmm. they expect to change areas. I wouldn't say frequently, but uh, s s several times, perhaps over the course of a decade. And they just think of themselves as technologist or developer. Give me anything, I'll work on it. Um, and other other folks prefer um, uh, so generalists versus specialists. Yeah, I would say um, one thing that I've noticed over time is that, like, if 
a lot of jobs that you'll get working with computers are going to involve solving some particular business problem. So you'll start fairly high up and you'll have to understand things about that business. But I've noticed that some people naturally tend to look down the stack, like look at the tools they're using to solve that problem and become more interested in those tools than the business problem. Um, and, I, and sort of burrow further down that stack, right? <laughs> and I guess I've, I've always tended to do that, which is how I finished up working on databases and being interested in operating systems, for example, even though perhaps at the time I was supposed to be working on some user-facing app, you know? <laughs> um, yeah. I think that's how we first bonded, Thomas. You found out that I used to work at Sun in the kernel group, and, and you just wanted to talk about Solaris for a couple of hours. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, you definitely focus on the lower parts of the stack. Um, yeah. And, and, Claire, and I, a good... Oh, sorry, go ahead. I Ask your question. Go for it, Pina. I Do was going to ask you, is this a good moment to segue to your, your experience? I want to hear more about uh, your time, uh, well, how you got started. You know, I, as a, um, as a dev. my plan was to become a patent attorney. And I was going to go to college and study engineering and um, be an engineer for a couple of years and then then go to law school. And so that was the grand plan. And, I, 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 have, um, I have to interrupt you and before, you before you move on from that, because how do you start off planning to be a patent attorney? That, that, that seems like not, not a common dream for folks. Honestly, I, I think people uh, children are so influenced i think by by or at least i was influenced by all the adults around me who would look at me and see that i was good in math and sciences but also see um how i like to debate and discuss and try to you know influence people and they're like oh you should be an attorney and so i don't know it's just i just got it in my head that that's what i was going to do went to college um found out that uh, material science kicked my butt and wasn't going to become an engineer, but along the way, um, took some computer science classes and just absolutely loved it. Like my first course was in Pascal and, you know, next I took the data structures and algorithms course. And then, you know, just kept taking more and more and more and more. And before I knew it, I, you know, had dropped out of engineering and was studying mostly, um, applied mathematics and computer science. So that's what I got my degree in. And then I had it in my head. I wanted to live in California for a couple of years and, um, Back in the day, Sun wasn't doing college recruiting, but I knew someone who knew someone who knew someone, and they landed me an interview at Sun and, you know, moved out to California, um, worked in developer tools in the beginning before I went to the kernel group, and uh, just loved being an engineer and decided not to move to the East Coast, not to, back to the East Coast, not to apply to law school, and just stayed in tech. Um, so... I don't know. It's kind of boring to me because you know it's a story that's very familiar to me, and I I know it well. But um, mm -hmm. it 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 was a lot of fun. Um, Sun was an exciting place back in that, those days, um, and I mean that's even before we called it Solaris. It was Sun OS um, in the beginning, and I got to work with absolutely brilliant people. I sometimes think of it as Camelot. Um, just those those days and that team and everybody was um, very uh, just tightly connected to each other and to our mission. And uh, uh, yeah, although I did, I mean, I still think of myself as a developer, but I did gravitate later toward becoming uh, an engineering manager and a program manager and to leading teams of people. Um, and and that's still kind of the the role that that I'm in. So I still work really closely with engineering teams, but um, more on figuring out like how do we communicate what we're doing or how do we do community building um, around this project. I think it's so interesting the idea of like what people tell you, adults tell you you're good at or reinforce when you're growing up and how that affects what you think you want to be. So I think that was like... For me, I was always, everyone was always like, oh, you're so good at writing and you're so good at, you know, like creative things and art and a lot. And also people in my family were in uh, TV and filmmaking. And so that was what I thought I was going to do. And then once you do it and people tell you, oh, you're good at this, you know, you like keep doing it. And I think, you know, if you 
I think it's easy to decide to do the things that you're good at and or that people tell you you're good at. And so I always find it interesting when when people sort of deviate from the path that they're on or like they decide to pivot and lean into the thing that they enjoy more um, and whether or not, you know, it was the thing that people suggested that they do. I had this English teacher in high school um, and he used to wear, he's very memorable. He used to have a bow tie on every single day and as he taught his class. And he used to always say that his wish for us was that our avocation and our vocations would be one and the same. And um, he would share how happy he was that his avocation and his vocation were one and the same. He absolutely loved his job. And so whether, whether the things people tell you when you're a kid stick and whether you do them or whether you deviate, like, I just think it is so cool when people land in a spot, I call it passing the toothbrush test, right? Where you're brushing your teeth in the morning and you're looking forward to whatever that work thing is that you're going to do that day. Um, I know that's certainly what I wish, I wish for my kids um, as they grow up. Do you think there's something a little bit unusual about our field, though, in that in that if you grew up tinkering or or you or you eventually ran into into software development at some point, uh, into into coding, that that what you got to experience is it matches pretty closely what you do uh, on a day to day basis as an engineer. In other fields, it's very hard for folks to to imagine what their day to day work life will be will be like um, as a you say you're a high schooler thinking about a career, and it's it's just hard to imagine what we'd be doing on a daily basis. What kind of problems would we try? Would we be trying to solve? At least that's the feeling I get. That there, there's yeah. less of a gap for 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 software. Yeah, yeah. I tot I I totally feel like the um the thing that I tell people is like the actual thing that I do, like whatever, however many hours a day, like I really enjoy that thing. And it like, it, it's the the bulk of my time is spent doing coding and, and trying to think about interesting things and making things as opposed to like, I think there are other jobs where the, the part that you're doing, that's the thing, the meat of what you really want to do is maybe less of the hours of your day. So before we pivot to Postgres, I actually am really curious, Pino, how you got started. I don't actually sure, know this sure. story. So let's see. So I, I I didn't really touch a computer except for learning to type, to, to, to touch type. Um, and so until I was in, in, in college, so freshman year of college, um, my brother, who my brother is two years older, Leo, uh, he said, you should take a, a coding course. And I think it was C++, the, the intro to programming. So um, I, I, I start taking that and I see that. So I, I, I always liked math as a, as a, as a student, um, problem solving, algorithms. And so I, um, uh, so, so I find I'm good at it, but um, not good. So I'm, I'm good at the coding part, uh, build, you know, writing the code, the algorithms. Uh, not good at all at the setup of the IDE, the, 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 the build path all of the things that you have to do around the program or to, to make the program actually compile and, and run. Um, but fortunately, in that first course, I had uh, um, was, worked in pairs, and uh, Jerry was a classmate who eventually who ended, up, ended up going to medical school. Um, but we worked in pairs, and he, and he could do all that stuff that I, that I didn't, wasn't interested in doing. And unfortunately, I didn't bother to learn that. And, I, and, and for, for, for many years, I always managed to find someone who would do those parts of the of of the work for me, um, and and so um, for a while. So and to this day, that remain, the, those parts of the job remain my my weakness. Um, yep. And so that... uh, maybe I'll uh, add that after after college. I'll say that I I sorry just just to finish that. I guess I'd, I'd say that I probably fell into software because it's it's what I knew how to do. It was fun. It was fun. It was exciting, and and I found that um, uh, so ninety nine I graduated. I went off for a year and 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 was a a volunteer math teacher. Um, but when I finished that, I um, it, it seemed like the natural thing to do. I knew I knew how to do it. It was fun. There there were startups. This is uh, two thousand. There was so much excitement in the field. It it didn't even occur to me to 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 wonder to 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 ask about anything else I could do. 
Um, and that's, I, I think, momentum carried me for, for a very long time. Although I did swing, as you, uh, um, it, um, it resonated with me that you said, you gravitated towards engineering management um, and, 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 and working with people. I, I, um, I had the same, the same experience. Maybe I, I, I went back and forth a few times, um, mostly out of a feeling of, 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 I'll say, not entirely because I loved it, but more because I felt I had to keep those skills up. What I really loved was working with people on technical problems. Very cool. So um, the, the title of today was not just how did I get started as a developer, but how I got started in Postgres. Um, and obviously this podcast is for... Um, you know, developers of all types, but specifically, like we we have had pretty much all of our guests have something to do with the Postgres community. Um, sometimes with Citus, often Postgres more generally. So, how did you get started working in Postgres? And this time, we'll start with Thomas. Okay. So, um, I I had a, a number of jobs um, that involved databases, and I finished up using probably most of the big name relational databases over the years. Um, but in, in the, in the, sometime in the late 90s, I, or mid to, yeah, mid to late 90s, I um, had a kind of a side project with a couple of friends of mine. I, I, I hesitate to call it a startup because it wasn't like terribly business focused. We weren't really that serious, but we set up this website where you could, when you were traveling around the world, you could make maps and you could show where you'd been and you could, and this was around the time when digital cameras were starting to come out, and we wanted a place to upload photographs. And you could see, you could write a journal entry at each point, and you could sort of show where you'd been. And in, 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 um, travel blogging is—I don't think the word blogging had been invented yet, but we—it was kind of travel blogging, right? And it went pretty well. We got up to—I I don't know, like fifty thousand users or something like that. I can't remember the exact numbers, but um, and. In, in the end, that, that sort of fizzled out with the advent of, um, I don't know, Facebook and all those kind of things that kind of wiped out all of the smaller blogging type things that people used to, used to exist back then. Um, but that ran, we, we wrote that um, as a side project and we used MySQL. Um, and we, there was a particular moment where we got some coverage on a, on a like our, our website was mentioned on some, US TV program or radio program. I've forgotten what it was. And we got a lot of hits and our system completely melted down. And we spent a couple of days figuring out like what do we need to do to fix this? Like how can we handle more load? And that was kind of the beginning of a study of locking that led me to Postgres. And I was like, my first attempt to use Postgres for that, um, I realized that at the time, Postgres was slower than MySQL at simple sequential queries because I'm talking about MySQL in the days of my ISAM. Um, back in those days, it, it, it could run simple queries much faster than Postgres, but it couldn't run them concurrent with concurrency um, because it had a much simpler locking model. And um, so we switched over to Postgres and the, it, we were able to handle a lot, a lot more load just because of the, the way those systems worked. And now I know that MySQL since then has completely changed the way it does that stuff because it now uses InnoDB and so on. I'm, so I'm not, this isn't really the point of my story isn't MySQL versus Postgres, but I'm just explaining there was this kind of moment when it, it solved a very specific problem that I had. And after that, I, uh, it, it, the system ran really well, and I started learning more and more about Postgres from there. Um, but it wasn't until much later, it wasn't until Postgres 9.5, so I'm not sure what, what year is that? Uh, well, a, a decade later anyway, um, that I first wrote a patch for it. And that was... Uh, I was working for a um, I was working for a company that had um, really large data processing systems um, using Oracle and DB2, and there was this particular queue processing problem that I've talked about before, even at CytusCon. I gave a talk about queue processing. Yeah, last year, right? Yeah. Queues in Postgres. Um, that's right. And so there's a particular moment where we, I was, you know there was a discussion about whether we could move this particular system over to Postgres and it was using the skip locked feature of um, Oracle. At least that was, that was one of the, and, and 
it was an area we realized that Postgres wasn't quite as good at. And so I stayed up late, stayed up late um, hacking on my first patch for Postgres um, to, to add that feature. And it was just a really rewarding experience. I mean, I, I, I wrote a patch to, to add for update skip locked, which is, you know, a relatively simple thing. It, it, if you if you need it, you need it. It's, but it's you know it's not not rocket science. It's a, it's a pretty simple thing that um, a lot of relational databases have. Um, but when I posted the patch, I found all these people were interested in it, and other people had thought about this problem as well. And then people jumped on it and reviewed it, and um, I was like, wow, uh, I, I'm not the only one that wants this. And um, wow, maybe this is actually going to work. And after a while. Um, uh, a few rounds of review and 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 so forth. Um, Alvaro you, Herrera, who you had on this call, uh, you had on on an earlier episode, I believe, of Path of Cytoscon, uh, committed that yes. patch, and after that, I was like, "Wow, that was just." Um, I, I wish I could do this kind of stuff all the time. You know? <laughs> and um, were you yeah, a complete then, then I, stranger to the Postgres community when you submitted that first patch? Had anyone ever heard of Thomas? Monroe? I had participated in a few discussions here and there, but not in any significant way. Not really. Um, I mean, I'd, I think I'd reported some bugs or I can't remember really, uh, but no, essentially I was not well known. Um, and then, um, yeah, there was a particular moment where, yeah, I actually got talking to someone at FOSDEM who, um, who told me that, um, you know, really, like it was the first point, the first moment I realized that, you, that, that there were companies that would hire you just to, to work on upstream Postgres um, and, not, and not improving it as a side product of what they were doing, but, but actually just literally working on it directly. That was the realization that, it, you know, it was possible to do that. Maybe not full time, but maybe with a part of your time. And I managed to... Um, get my first job working full-time on Postgres um, at Enterprise DB. And that was, um, that, that coincided with a, with, with a big move. My, you know, we, we, we moved from London where I'd been for a long time, uh, uh, back to New Zealand where I'm from. And I kind of knew I wasn't going to be able to work in, in financial technology out here in New Zealand because there just isn't that much of that sort of industry. Um, and so I was, I was really looking for a change and it was around that time that I heard about, um, the possibility to to work for enterprise db and that um yeah that that plan worked and i finished up getting to work on work with them um, people who were working full-time on, on postgres on, on really interesting problems and um yeah and thomas yeah. i guess because of the way the pg community works being on the other side on the other side of the world uh didn't uh wasn't a, an impediment not at all. I mean, everyone that I, uh, everyone that I interacted with um, was living in different, you know, wherever they wanted to live, right? I mean, maybe a lot of people are in the States, for example, but they're not all in San Francisco or something like that. They're, they're, they live, they work from home if they want to, and it could be anywhere, right? So, I mean, my time zone's a little weird, but it's not, you know, there's, there's plenty of overlap, so... No, in this pivotal what? conversation that you had at Fosdem with someone where they planted the seed in your mind that <laughs> you could work for a company that would pay you to work on, to contribute to Postgres open source. Um, Fosdem is an easy place to get lost at. At least that's my experience. The first time I went there, it was just overwhelming and spread out and distributed. And um, were you in the Postgres dev room? And is that where you were connecting with Postgres people? Or how, how did that happen? Uh, well, I was lining up to to get a beer actually um, at Fosdem, and <laughs> there's one of the great features of Bel uh, Belgium, of course. And lots of um, beer. there were actually, yeah, there, there, well, I mean, I wouldn't say lots of beer, but you know, the, 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 there's a there's a place where you can queue up and get some Belgian beer. And um, yeah, I, I was. Um, there were actually two different people around that time who I saw and suddenly realized that they were living in this way that I, that was, that was suddenly attractive to me. Like what, one of them was, um, a friend of mine who, who works on, um, GCC, he went to work for Red Hat and, um, uh, you know, I'm not a, not a compiler guy. I wasn't particularly interested in, 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 in that specific thing, but, um, just 
like he, he moved around the time that I was moving away from London and he, uh, and he was moving to live in a small English village and with a cricket green in the, in, in, in the middle and, you know, and, and live in a kind of a different way and, and could work from home and work on, on compilers, which is, or standard libraries and things like that, that were, that it's his thing. And, um, I was like, wow, that's, um, pretty eye opening. You can, you know, you, there's a lot of possibilities out there, right? I mean, if you can contribute to open source software, you can, you can live however you, you know, you can live in wherever you want. Um, so, yeah. Did, did you feel strongly about the open source aspect of it? Because I noticed throughout your story, there's a thread of like the contrast between how inaccessible and expensive, you know, like being part of closed source is versus open source. And like, did you want to move to working on open source specifically after leaving the financial industry? Or was it more like that was what was possible in New Zealand? Oh, definitely. I, I mean, it gets you in touch with so many more people and it gets you, um, you know, outside of a, cl a small closed environment, you know, um, I'm not like religious about it or anything. Like I don't, I'm not, I, I don't think I'm not saying proprietary software is bad or anything like that. I just, it, it speaks to me much more to, to, to be part of a, a, of, of a sort of an open community where people are collaborating. I, I just love that. Um, yeah. How do you feel about it, Melanie? Is it important to you that yeah, Postgres I mean, is feel... open source? Well, yeah, definitely. I'm, I mean, to the question of sort of like how getting involved in Postgres was something where, you know, I was not working when I started Tra you know, like trying to learn to code and get a job as a developer. And so I didn't have access to, you know, a closed source code base. So like uh, when I started working on post or reading Postgres code, I wouldn't have been able to do that if it was closed source, right? <laughs> so um, it was, I think this moment where I was like, I mean, I wasn't, working in tech when sort of the open source movement first started happening. And um, so I just saw the contrast because when I did IT consulting, we mostly implemented, well, pretty much entirely implemented like closed source software at different client sites. And, um, you know, of course, we couldn't see the code. And then because we were just like professional services, basically not working for the company directly. And then seeing how like, if I'm not being paid to work on something at all, that I can still see this code and learn from it. And I mean, there's resources online to learn how to code, but there's a big difference between seeing like toy programs or small projects and actually being able to see production code of something that, you know, people are, that's being used by people all over the world. And I guess like my initial interest in technology was as an equalizer and as something to empower people who didn't have power, you know? And I think that is, while I will not pretend that tech is completely egalitarian and anyone can do it and that kind of thing, I think uh, like the principles behind open source and really align with some of the things that we've been able to do with technology. And, and I think it's like, so important and that in some ways I think we need sort of like zealots like Richard Stallman and that kind of thing to like really move things forward because and to, to hold the line about like you know open source like I mean I still use closed source software so I'm, I'm not I'm not like religious about it I'm definitely like this is convenient but I think, um, you know, there's been times throughout my journey working on Postgres where I thought, I don't know if this is going to work out. I don't know if I can keep doing this. And, you know, what would I do instead? And I think it would be, I'm not saying I won't, it wouldn't happen, but it will be hard. It would be hard for me after having the chance to work on open source and feeling like I'm part of something that has the possibility to include everyone to go and work in close source. I, I think it would be hard for me. And one thing that I've noticed is like when you talk to people that were part of open source when it started, there was more, I mean, it was just, it's things were open source for different reasons in some ways than they are now. 
So like now, you know, companies talk about open sourcing stuff for strategic reasons. Like, you know, there's this really cool open source conference in um, Raleigh Durham every year called All Things Open. That's kind of like um, just all different. It's like thousands of people go to it. And it's different than Fostum. It's like on the other end of the spectrum. I mean, I haven't been to Fostum, but I get the sense that's like kind of the original open source mission around like free open source collaboration, that kind of thing. But now, you know, open source is, has been companies open source software strategically to for different reasons, right? It's part of like a a business plan and it's something that's sort of like packaged and a product of like whatever capitalism, right? It's like a it's like a thing companies do. So Facebook and Google and all these places are doing that. And I think it's good. I mean, it's making more software open and more people can use it and you can build a website with completely open source components when you're you know, on a laptop in college or whatever. And I think it's great, but it's also like pe- people that are coming up in open source now are seeing a very different sort of core mission or like ethos, I think, of open source. And I mean, I I don't know like what the implications of that are, but I think that um, that's interesting. Yeah, there are nope. a lot more reasons to open source software now and a lot, many more different motivations. But I think the cool net effect of it is there's a lot more open source software. Um, and so, I don't know. The- I mean, so, so, certainly Postgres and um, and I think Ingress, that its predecessor, were, were open sourced for, or, or given a BSD license um, for strategic reasons back in, in the beginning, I, I, I think you can say, because, you know, they would, they would developed at Berkeley University and then also uh, turned into commercial products by their creators that were, you know, I mean, the, the BSC license was, was part of that. And that, like, the ability, the ability for people to be able to make money from things while also releasing the source code, um, you know, that, that's something that happened right at the beginning of Postgres's story, right? Um, you know, I realized... with this statement? Um, um, companies, companies decide whether to open source partly based on talent, but there's always the business justification. On the other side of the market, developers, now that there's so much open source, there are more and more developers that want to guarantee that they'll spend at least some of their time or most of their time coding open source projects. Would you agree with that? I I think that if you're asking me, I think that's true. Yeah, people, I I hear a lot of people who want some kind of time carved out for for contributing to open source. Yeah. Okay, so I realized that we actually didn't get Melanie's answer to how she got started in Postgres. Like we talked about your perspective on open source and the motivations, and um, but I want to know what was what, was there a moment? Is there a story? Uh, were you doing something else altogether different, and then pivoted to Postgres? Yeah, so I was doing uh, IT consulting at. PwC at PricewaterhouseCoopers, and we uh, there was a project we were doing that was related to data quality and sort of like um, there are different proprietary software you can use to essentially I, what they're doing is <laughs> like writing SQL to query things about the customer's database. So like you know what are using regular expressions and things like that to check if they have more than one record for the same customer, you signed up with an email address and you twice and you spelled your name slightly differently or things like that. Right. Um, and so, uh, we had decided to, the proprietary tools that we were using were difficult because we were trying to collaborate with people from different companies and, um, multiple, di- the team had changed a lot. There's like new people joining and other people leaving and just the licensing and dealing with everyone trying to have access to the proprietary software was slowing us down so much that I was like, let's just, I mean, this is probably against the rules now that I think about it. I was like, let's just dump this data into a database and then use regular SQL to query it because we're spending most of our time in meetings talking about how 
like no one can access this data in order to do these queries, right? And um, so then we ended up writing a bunch of very similar kinds of like SQL queries, and it felt like um, we were wasting a lot of time on boilerplate. Uh, and we and I decided to use Postgres. I think this was nine six, but I'm not sure. I'd have to look at the exact version. Um, just because I like Googled around and, and talked to some friends that were in tech and they're like, everyone used Postgres, it's the best to open source stuff because I wanted something that I didn't have to pay for and sort of just didn't get permission to really do the project this way. So I was like, okay, what's free? What can I use? Um, and uh, But I found that also what I wanted to do was to be able, so Postgres has a string function called format and it lets you do like string interpolation. And... Um, so I wanted to do something closer to like templating to create SQL queries, but I wasn't building a whole application. And I didn't, at the time, I originally didn't want to use like Jinja 2 or whatever. So I think I ended up doing that eventually. So I wrote a Postgres extension. And this actually, at the time, my, I was trying to figure out how do I make format do the thing I want or do I need to use another piece of software with it or whatever. And so someone told me, um, that Postgres has this extensibility thing and you can write extensions and they can like access internal Postgres code and, and do cool things with it if you write them in C. Um, so I tried to figure out how to do that. And so I wrote this extension that basically was a souped up format function that let you interpolate, um, like you could put make named parameters and then so you could pass and then you could pass json b or h stores to it and so you could like have the key that was in your h store or json b and then it would interpolate the the value um and i just thought it was so cool that you didn't actually have to you could just do that you could just make it and then you could use it <laughs> and um that was my first time looking at postgres code and um i just I had this feeling that I hadn't had before where I was like, this just makes sense. And um, so I leaned into it. And then I remember I was at All Things Open and the there was a developer advocate for, for Mozilla there talking about Rust. And his talk was about why do systems programming? And he, I guess, made the argument that if... Like you just kind of feel excited when you understand how something works, like um, under the hood, kind of like what Thomas was saying, right? Like you just want to keep traveling further down the stack and you sort of lose interest in the business problems at some point um, or just are less engaged in those, that that may be a sign that you want to be a systems engineer. Um, and so that's kind of what I was like, that's the feeling that I'm feeling is that I stopped caring about templating those SQL queries and I cared more about how does this work, you know, and that I decided at the time, looking back, it was pretty crazy that I, I thought this was something that was possible, but I was like, I want to get paid to, to contribute to Postgres and I'm going to, or I'm going to work at a database company because I want to do this. And I'd like, didn't study CS, had never had a job as a programmer. <laughs> just like, it's like, all right, I'm not going to take a job that's not that. So <laughs> it's kind of nuts looking back on it because there aren't that many jobs like that, right? Just like the number of people that do that is not very many. So, yeah. So you left Pricewaterhouse and eventually landed at, what was your first database company? It was a Pivotal working on Greenplum, yeah. So... They were really, it was just so, I mean, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that. Cause like I said, I learned from collaboration and from working with other people much better than through reading or, um, you know, sort of taking a class and listening to lectures. So I, I left, I like saved up enough money to give myself runway for, I thought a year, but then living be, is expensive. So, <laughs> um, and basically said, I'm going to learn everything I can. And then I'm also going to try to like make a portfolio basically. And um, so, and I, I mean, I was familiar with some database concepts from the job that I'd had in consulting with data quality. But um, so I did the Postgres extension, I sort of polished it and 
you know, made it open source and then um, did more hacking on Postgres. And then I was looking for jobs and I, I applied, I think Vertica, I applied to HP, is it? The, I think, but yeah, I was just looking for databases and I preferred open source, but I was like, okay, I want to work on a database. So I applied at a bunch of different database companies. I interviewed at Second Quadrant actually. And, um, and then with Pivotal, it was just like, they were so focused on collaboration and pair programming. And that was exactly what I was looking for. And I mean, in a lot of ways, they took a big, big risk on me, right? Because like, I didn't have a track record of being a software engineer at other companies or, you know, the bunch of people that worked there had PhDs in query execution and um, just completely different level of qualifications than I had. Um, and for months of working there, people just would pair program and, and like teach me things. And I kind of, at that point was like, okay, I'm going to go back to school and start taking classes on some of the fundamentals. So I, you know, I went, I did some Stanford classes on databases and then I did some of CMU classes on OS, you know, like learning about operating systems. And, um, I just spent all my free time. Okay. Can I, you know, so green plum is a distributed fork. Uh, it's a distributed database. That's a fork of Postgres. So, um, you know, like how, what are distributed systems? How do I learn about that? And, um, and then all my spare time, I was like, how do I learn more? How do I, you know, what is post, like how, how does Postgres upstream development process work? How, you know, let me look at patches and everything. Yeah. Well, plus one to the hiring manager at Greenplum who took <laughs> that risk on you. Obviously it paid off. Um, I always think it takes a special kind of courage for a manager to hire, not because this person has already done the thing that we're hiring them for, but to hire someone who's got the skills, the motivation, the ability and the willingness to learn and learn and learn. And I sometimes feel like those those types of gambles, like that's 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 where the joy is. And, and those type of gambles can often pay off really, really well, but not everybody does that. So yeah. Um, it's, I'm, yeah, we, I'm glad they did it because now you're here at Microsoft and I'm um, still working on Postgres and just contributed something pretty, pretty sweet to PG-16. Yeah, definitely great. So are, to... are other Postgres contributor stories the same as, as yours, Thomas and Melanie? Like, is, is there a certain pattern? Uh, at least... I can answer that. Oh, go. go. No, go for it. I kind of want, yeah. want you both to answer, so just take turns. I would say um, it, it's very non-uniform. People all have very different uh, backstories. That may be true in, in, in any group of people in, 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 in any project. I'm, I'm not sure, but it, certainly with um, certainly the, the people that I know in the Postgres community have all, all different sorts of backgrounds and, and and there's a lot of people for example who 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 didn't study computer science or something like that um if that's what you're getting at um yeah melanie what's your yeah i think um your... i often ask people this since i didn't you know study cs undergrad and uh i i mean i would say like majority of people that you talk to that are postgres contributors did do some sort of studying of IT or computers or that kind of thing. Um, but uh, certainly not all of them. And I think I, I would argue there might be a disproportionate number of people that sort of fall into that solo hacker category and maybe, you know, didn't, didn't finish school or didn't like necessarily stick to that one specific path or study that exact thing. And, um, you know, I think wouldn't necessarily... I think Postgres being open source and having a lot of enthusiasts be the people that were working on it in their spare time and that kind of thing, I think is a big part of of the background of people. Um, I guess we have a set of questions that we wanted to ask you um, that Pino and I collaborated on beforehand. And neither one of us um, will own up to writing this question down. So I don't know how it got on our list. 
but it's <laughs> is being a developer all sunshine and roses. I I I'm just going to ask it anyway. Well, I, I could say um, that there's a there's an enormous amount of maintenance work involved in projects like this, um, investigating bugs. I mean, the number of users of Postgres is absolutely enormous, right? I mean, there's there's uh, we don't even have um, a way to begin to estimate the number of databases out there. I don't think, but um, the number of you know users of Postgres, but it's going to be a very large number, and that's kind of stressful, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, if there's if there's a if, if bug reports are coming in and you don't know, you don't yet have a, any clue what the blast radius is, or you know, that's yeah, you kind of drop everything and focus on that for a long time. Maybe trying to reproduce something that's timing based or something like that. And there's this, there's this a huge amount of work like that that's just um, you know can be quite stressful. Um, it's not all developing. Could you list off some of those amazing. comments? That it, it was. It wasn't. You know. In retrospect, of course, it's obvious. But it 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 goes. You know. Reminders are great uh, about. You know. The maintaining the build farms. Um, uh -huh. The commit fest software. Um, right. C could you give some more examples of stuff that isn't isn't right. isn't the core software, but makes makes stuff go right. The, the build. Uh, the 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 CI system. Well, there's a, there's a whole. Yeah, there's a whole process for. I don't know how many people contribute to, to Postgres exactly. There are different ways to estimate it, but you can say there's, there's a couple of hundred people who are actively working on patches at, at any given time, I think. Um, and those people are, all have, they're all trying to, like they would like to see certain patches they've worked on get in. And um, they would, you know, they're trying to get other people in the community to, to, to you know, build consensus and agree that a certain feature is ready to go in or whatever, or or just, Trying to get people to review things, and you know, there's, there's just a huge amount of human interaction there, and a huge amount of expectation and disappointment. Sometimes things just don't go in for a, for a whole year or two years or something like that. Or sometimes things are outright rejected. Sometimes things just don't work out. They get committed and then they get reverted, and we never get back to them. Or or you need to go around again, and it takes another whole year. And you know, there's there's a lot of processes and pain and emotions and you know all those kinds of things involved i guess maybe like any collaborative um you know enterprise but um it, it's not just wow we made this amazing new feature and everyone's happy at the end it's it's an ongoing process and, and once you even when you manage to get things in and and they they work and and everyone's happy it, it, Things like query planners, for example, are, are incredibly complex things, and you can make some people happy and other people sad when you make a change. You know, maybe maybe blowback comes for years, telling you that you're like if you look at something like the like the the JIT query compilation stuff that happened a few years ago. Um, now that's really amazing technology, and it makes a whole lot of um, long running queries run a lot faster. But it also slows down some workloads, and you've got to tune things to uh, turn it off sometimes because. Uh, you know, and I don't know. The, the, it's a really complex system. So I think, uh, and I think that's interesting. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Thomas. No, oh, and I uh, uh, just to uh, answer Pina's question about the stuff like the build farm. We have this Postgres is uncommonly portable. I don't think there's, and that's partly to do with its age. It it, it comes from the time of the, you know. Cambrian explosion of Unix operating systems that used to run on all these different systems, and gradually we prune the set of systems we support. But we still support ten, or depending on how you count, ten or eleven operating systems. Um, and so we have this, um, including Solaris and AIX, um, and you know various systems that um, some people care about. And we have this build farm that tests everything on on hundreds of computers and runs runs our test suite. And it fails sometimes, and we. Uh, you know, for timing reasons on some obscure computer system, and we have to try and figure out why. If it, you know, like, is it a problem with that particular machine, or is there is there a bug? Probably the answer is there's a bug somewhere, or some race condition somewhere. And um, so you can just look at the, the Postgres build farm results, and you can find problems to investigate that will take days and days of your life, and will turn out to be because of some order of operation thing somewhere, or more likely just a timing bug in the test itself or something like that. And 
yeah, there's, uh, there's a huge amounts of different types of work involved in keeping this thing running. Um, well, Melanie, you're one of the it. things, in, yeah, I was just going to say the thing that's interesting about working in open source is that there isn't some specific roadmap and then you work on a feature and we've all agreed it's the thing that we're going to work on. And when it's done, you know, it gets to go in. Uh, people pick up projects and try to build consensus around them. And um, and that's true for, for core Postgres code. And it's also true for like tools and frameworks and things that, that the Postgres developers and other people build to try to make development easier. There's, you know, a thousand little factors that can make it like, okay, this thing actually isn't something that we can support and merge. And I think the calculus for whether or not to work on something, it can be difficult. Um, like, and figuring out all of the different things that you need to do and whether or not you should do each of those things and whether or not it's actually um, the right use of time and, and all of that. It's not something that's spelled out and dictated and then these are the priorities and then we just do them. And everyone in the community is doing you know, three projects on the side or maintaining a tool or something like that, that you didn't know about that's outside of their core work that's contributing to the community. Like Thomas developed CFBot, which is something that, I mean, pretty much like we completely rely on in, in the commit fest to, to show if past uh, patches are that are in registered for commit fest are passing. Um, and that's just something that was like, he was like, Oh, this is this problem. And, you know, let me just write something to solve it. And it, it wasn't like a simple, trivial project. And he didn't know if people were going to use it or not. Right. So it's like kind of this, it's interesting to try to find motivation and figure out what is the right way to use your time, because there's a thousand things that you could do. Like what he said, there's a thousand projects on the list of projects that I would like to work on or tools that I thought of making that would help with Postgres or ideas that I had or wanted to try. And I think most Postgres developers have that or most engineers probably have that, which is like, there's all these things I could work on. And I think typically if you're in a corporate environment, there's very clear business priorities. If you do these things, they will, you know, get merged. And it's different when you work in open source. Well, one of the things I've observed is a lot of the developers, whether they're they're committers, contributors, um, they also contribute in ways that go beyond code. And and if there's college students listening to this or trying to imagine what their future jobs in open source software might be like, I mean, people focus on helping with error message translations, right, across a ton of different languages. Um, a, a, you both were at PGCon last week, right? You both gave talks. So there's the whole notion of giving conference talks to help other people understand either a, a new feature or your perspective on a problem. Um, the demos that people create. And um, I've even, there's a whole bunch of Postgres um, contributors who help to organize conferences, right? To bring people together. Because as you said, Thomas, before we started today's podcast, that it was so awesome to see people in person again last week. Um, mm. So there's there's a lot of ways that people end up contributing to a community that go beyond code. I mean, another example is, Thomas, you reached out to me recently to try to figure out, like, how can we get Windows, I think you wanted um, Azure VM credits, on Windows to help with the QA efforts for, you know, the next version of Postgres, right? So, mm. um, you know, figuring out who the right people are to ask and uh, make something like that happen, that ends up being on some developers' plates too. Yeah. So I think what that means to me is that, and tell me if I'm right or wrong, I could be wrong, um, that the way you spend your days isn't always the same, the same, the same. Definitely true. I, I mean, I guess one of the things Melanie was talking about how if you, um, if you work on a more traditional software project where your, your goal is to produce, I know this is an oversimplification, nobody's job is like this, but supposing you, you were to, you know, to compare with a job where you've, you're going to produce this one widget and, um, you know, you've got a 
a clear maybe you've got a, one boss and you've got one product line and you know maybe there are multiple projects underneath that but it's still kind of guided by a, a kind of hierarchical approach maybe no job is really like that but but still um, I, I find working in open source tends to be very different from that uh, because you've got you're communicating with a lot of different people about a lot of different things everybody wants something slightly different and you've kind of got to figure out which things to say no to which is it can be quite tricky you know which oh. things the, the only way you can focus on something is to not focus on something else right so um and you know cho choosing how to allocate um your your limited r r time and resources when you're communicating with so many people about so many things can be a little tricky. Um, so you're saying that your time management skills are important, like improving those, being aware of those and, and um, fine tuning them? I guess so. I mean, I, I, I wish I could be better at that myself. <laughs> um, I mean, the trouble is there's so many interesting things as well. Like you can be genuinely interested in all these different things and you want to see them advance. So figuring out how to, figuring out how to, help with individual projects that are happening in the community without um, getting completely lost in one of them and then not doing the other things, you know, that's really, uh, that's something that I struggle with uh, personally. If I, I guess I'm still kind of responding to, is it all roses and honey or whatever it was? Sunshine and roses. <laughs> I think there's also <laughs> stages to, to, at least I've found for myself in working in the community where at the beginning, like every project you do, no matter what it is, you're going to learn something from. And so it doesn't matter what it is. Like it's nothing is, you don't have to be that strategic in what you work on because like you're just trying to, to, to scramble and, and cover some sur enough surface area to get a, a handhold, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And, and there's lots of, you know, basically anything you do is like a good use of your time almost. Um, and then you kind of get to the point where if you want to see work go in or you kind of have to think about like more strategically about how to spend your time. I mean, there's a, so much of the Postgres code base I don't know and, and I still have so much to learn. But I think that transition to when you have to think about which projects to work on and, and, and be more strategic, I think, is kind of an interesting thing. And, th and that applies to, to tools and to sort of things outside of outside of core as well or uh, community engagement um you know do i want to give talks this year or do i want to volunteer in one of the committees for the next developer conference or do i want to um you know run a workshop for prospective developers you can't do it all do i want to be try to do be a commit fest manager like and figuring out how to spend your time again without explicit you know someone telling you okay this thing is worth five points and this thing is worth 10 or like this is a business priority <laughs> yeah. and this isn't i i don't know how to navigate that still it's like because it's not just what is the highest success rate like or what has the highest likelihood of succeeding and and it's not just what am i interested in and 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 what'll make my day most interesting it's like some combination of all of that plus what'll help enrich the community the most and and yeah, I, I don't know how to that formula, but it's hard. So if I were to try to summarize what you both are saying, when asked about, is it all sunshine and roses? You're saying there's a lot of different kinds of work, all of it meaningful. And uh, you know how much, you, how much you like it depends on your, your tastes. You both gravitated towards this, I don't know if it's existential anxiety, but a certain kind of <laughs> angst around how you choose what to do in the absence of top-down hierarchy or direction yeah. uh, is that right and are there are, are, because I, I mean i think that's great i mean i i walk away th saying okay that, that that's interesting is the psychological thing going on but otherwise it's mostly sunshine and roses or other 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 aspects that are not sunshine and roses beyond that angst well roses have thorns and I sunshine have... is sometimes blocked by clouds <laughs> I have fun pretty much every day. Like even if I'm stuck on a bug or I'm, you know, on an email thread that gets annoying <laughs> and hackers, I, I look forward to working every single day pretty much. Yeah. 
That's the toothbrush test. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. What about you, Thomas? Do you pass the oh, does, yeah, does I, your Postgres I, work? And in- most days, most days, I, I do love my job. I I think we're very lucky to be able to work on something that 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 we know how to improve and that a lot of people depend on, and that it you know it's it's satisfying to work on. I, yeah, definitely. Well, big thank you to both of you for joining us today. Um, This podcast will be made available um, within the next couple of days as a recording on YouTube, on YouTube podcasts, and um, we'll post that link on Twitter and Mastodon and LinkedIn and all the places. Carol Smith will take care of that. Um, We're also going to be making this podcast available across all the podcast platforms that people tend to prefer. Everybody has their own favorites. Um, So Carol and Aaron are working on a plan to do that as well. Um, So it'll be available on YouTube this week, um, but other places later. Um, I also want to throw a shout out to the fact that the next episode of Path to Cytoscon, episode five, is going to be on Wednesday, July 12th at 10 a.m. PDT. Um, And I want to thank Carol Smith and Aaron Wislank for producing this event, because without them, we wouldn't all be here today. but Thomas and Melanie, I, I could talk to you for another hour on this. And we have a whole bunch more questions that, that Pino and I didn't get a chance to ask. Uh, but we'll, we'll have to save those for another day. Are you all free for beers? <laughs> for it's a little early, but yeah. Before it's, I it's, here. it's definitely too early for Thomas. But uh, <laughs> yeah. Melanie, you're East Coast, right? So I'm East Coast, yeah. I yep. almost have a beer, maybe. Yeah. 2 p.m. Happy hour. <laughs> All right. Pino, thank you so much for co-hosting with me. Thank you. All Thanks right. for our guests. Thanks. It's Thanks a wrap. And oh, you, actually, I do have one more thing, which is um, to thank for those of you who are listening to this and who loved it, liked it. Um, as a new podcast, um, we appreciate recommendations. So um, subscribe to the calendar, um, but also recommend it to your friends so other people can discover it. And uh, yeah, we'll be back here on Discord on Wednesday, July 12th for the next episode.